So, since I forgot last time, and I'm not going to forget this time. You're welcome. Here's the reading guide. <laughs> so let me just take a quick look. I'm 99% sure we are on Empire of Storms till the end. Um, this is chapter 68. What does Tower... I just don't remember if we got to that last Tower of Dawn chapter. No, because there's still it says Tower of Dawn after the Empire of Storms. No, I'm talking about like right here. Oh. This Tower of Dawn. I mean, you guys can't see what I'm pointing at, but... Uh, we did. We did. So we are on Empire of Storms now until the end of the book. <laughs> well, then what's all these Tower of Dawn chapters after? Oh, until the end of this book. Yeah, until the end of this, until now the I end understand. of the book. I understand. And then was... we'll switch over to Tower of Dawn for the rest of that book. Now I see what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I was misunderstanding. Yes. Because we have two books here. Yes. I didn't say until the end of the tandem read. I said until the end of the you, book. You're correct. You, you said it. I just okay. wasn't grasping it, and I'm sure there's others that did. So, today, we're starting off with the Empire of Storms. Um, I don't know how long this stream is going to be, because if we get to the end where we only have, like, two or three chapters left, I'm just gonna, we're just gonna power through and get through it. Um... Just, just why leave two or three chapters left in a book, you know? Round it out. Anyways, with that being said, because I don't, I don't know how long the chapters are. <clears throat> we have approximately 621. We have approximately 69 pages, so we'll yeah. see if we get through it or not. That's a funny number. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. Anyways. <clears throat> Without further ado, on, for those of you following along, get your Empire of Storms books out and leave them out. <laughs> uh, chapter 68. It was an agony. An agony to see Nehemia. Young and strong and wise, speaking to Elena in the marshes, among those same ruins. And then there was the other agony, that Elena and Nehemia had known each other, worked together, that Elena had laid these plans a thousand years ago, that Nehemia had gone to Rifthold knowing she'd die, knowing she'd need to break Aelin, use her death to break her so she could walk away from the assassin and ascend her throne. Aelin and Manan were shown another scene of a whispered cover <coughs> conversation at midnight, deep beneath the glass castle, a queen and a princess meeting in secret, as they had for months, the queen asking the princess to pay that price she'd offered back in the marshes, to arrange for her own death, to set this all in motion, Nehemia had warned Elena that she, that Aelin, would be broken. Worse, that she would go so far into an abyss of rage and despair that she wouldn't be able to get out. Not as Selena. Nehemia had been right. Aelin was shaking, shaking in her half-invisible body, shaking so badly she thought her skin would ripple off her bones. Manon stepped closer perhaps the only comfort the witch knew how to offer. Solidarity. They stared into the swirling mist again, where the scenes, the memories, had unfolded. Aelin wasn't sure she could stomach another truth, another revelation of just how thoroughly Elena had sold her and Dorian to the gods, for the fool's mistake she'd made, not understanding the lock's true purpose, to seal Erewhon in his tomb rather than let Bran Brannon finally end it, and send the gods to wherever they called home, dragging Erewhon with him. Send them home, using the keys to open the word gate, and a new lock to seal it forever. Nameless is my price. Using her power, drain to the last drop, her life to forge that new lock. To wield the power of the keys only once, just once, to banish them all, and then seal the gate forever. 
Memories flickered by. Elena and Brannon screaming at each other in a room Aelin had not seen for ten years. The king's suite in the palace at Orinth. Her suite. Or it would have been. A necklace glittered at Elena's throat. The eye. The first and now broken lock that Elena, now the Queen of Adderlin, seemed to wear as some sort of reminder of her foolishness. Her promise to those furious gods. Her argument with her father raged and raged until the princess walked out. And Aelin knew Elena had never returned to that shining palace in the north. Then the reveal of that witch mirror in some nondescript stone chamber. A black-haired beauty with a crown of stars standing before Elena and Gavin, explaining how the witch mirror worked, how it would contain these memories. Rhiannon Kraken. Manon stared at the sight of her, and Aelin glanced between them. The face. It was the same. Manon's face and Rhiannon Kraken's, the last Kraken queens of two separate eras. Then an image of Brannon alone, head in his hands, weeping before a shrouded body atop a stone altar. A crone's bent shape lay beneath. Elena, her immortal grace yielded in order to live out a human lifespan with Gavin. Brannon still looked no older than thirty. Brannon. The heat of a thousand forges shining on his red-gold hair. His teeth bared in a star snarl as he pounded a metal disc on an anvil. The muscles of his back rippling beneath golden skin as he struck and struck and struck. As he forged the amulet of Orinth. As he placed a sliver of black stone within either side. Then sealed it. Defiance written in every line of his body then wrote the message in word marks on the back. One message. For her. For his true heir should Elena's punishment and promise to the gods hold true. The punishment and promise that had cleaved them. That Brandon could not and would not accept. Not while he had strength left. Nameless is my price. Written right there in word marks. The one who bore Brandon's mark the mark of the bastard born nameless. She would be the cost to end this. The message on the back of the amulet of Orange was the only warning he could offer, the only apology for what his daughter had done, even as it contained a secret inside so deadly no one must know. No one could ever be told. But there would be clues. For her. To finish what they'd started. Brandon built Elena's tomb with his own hands, Carved the messages in there for Aelin, too. The riddles and the clues. The best he could offer to explain the truth while keeping those keys hidden from the world. From powers who would use them to rule. To destroy. Then he made Mort. The medal for the door knocker gifted by Rhiannon Kraken, who brushed a hand over the king's cheek before she left the tomb. Rhiannon was not present when Brannon hid the sliver of black stone beneath the jewel in Elena's crown the second word key, or when he set Damaris in its stand, near the second sarcophagus, for the mortal king he hated and had barely tolerated. But he had leashed that loathing for his daughter's sake, even if Gavin had taken his daughter, the daughter of his soul, away from him. The final key. He went to Mala's temple. It was where he had wanted to end this all along anyway. The molten fire around the temple was a song in his blood, a beckoning, a welcoming. Only those with his gifts, her gifts, could, ent could get there. Even the priestesses could not reach the island in the heart of the molten river. Only his heir would be able to do that, or whoever held another key. So he set the remaining key under a flagstone. Then he walked into that molten river, to the burning heart of his beloved. And Brannon, King of Terrison, Lord of Fire, did not emerge again. Aelin didn't know why it surprised her to be able to cry in this body, that this body had tears to spill. But Aelin shed them for Brannon, who knew what Elena had promised to the gods, and had raged against it. 
the passing of this burden onto one of his descendants. Brandon had done what he could for her, to soften the blow of that promise, if he could not change its course wholly, to give Aelin a fighting chance. Nameless is my price. I don't understand what this means, Manon said quietly. Aelin did not have the words to tell her. She had not been able to tell Rowan. But then Elena appeared, real as they were, and stared into the fading golden light of Mala's temple as the memory vanished. I'm sorry, she said to Aelin. Manon stiffened at Elena's approach, taking a step from Aelin's side. It was the only way, she Elena offered. There was genuine pain in her eyes. Regret. Was it a choice, or just to spare Gavin's precious bloodline, that I was the one who was selected? The voice that came from Aelin's throat was raw, vicious. Why did why spill Havilliard blood, after all, when you could fall back on old habits and choose another to bear the burden? Elena flinched. Dorian was not ready. You were. The choice Nehemia and I made was to ensure that things went according to plan. According to plan? Aelin breathed. According to all your schemes to make me clean up the mess of what you started with your god's damned thieving and cowardice. They wanted me to suffer, Elena said, and I have. Knowing you must do this, bear this burden, it has been a steady, endless shredding of my soul for a thousand years. It was so easy to say yes, to imagine you would be a stranger, someone who would not need to know the truth, only to be put in the right place with the right gift, and yet, and yet I was wrong. I was so wrong. Elena lifted her hands before her, palms up. I thought Erewhon would rise, and the world would face him. I did not know. I did not know darkness would fall. I did not know that your land would suffer. Suffer as I tried to keep mine from suffering. And there were so many voices. So many voices, even before Adderlin conquered. It was those voices that woke me. The voices of those wishing for an answer. For help. Elena's eyes slid to Manon, then back to hers. They were from all kingdoms, all races. Human, which kind, fey. But they wove a tapestry of dreams, all begging for that one thing. A better world. Then you were born, and you were an answer to the gathering darkness with that flame. My father's flame, my mother's might, reborn at last. And you were strong, Aelin. So strong and so vulnerable. Not to outside threats, but the threat of your own heart. The isolation of your power. But there were those who knew you for what you were, what you could offer. Your parents, their court, your great uncle, and Adian. Adian knew you were the queen who was promised without knowing what it meant, without knowing anything about you, or me, or what I did to spare my own people. The words hit her like stones. The queen who was promised, Aelin said. But not to the world, to the gods, to the keys, to pay the price, to be their sacrifice in order to seal the keys in the gate at last. Deanna's appearance hadn't been only to tell her how to use the mirror, but to remind her that she belonged to them, had a debt owed to them, Aelin said too quietly. I didn't survive that night in the Florian River because of pure luck, did I? Aelin, Elena shook her head. We did not. No, Aelin snapped. Show me. Elena's throat bobbed, but then the mists turned dark and colored, and the very air around them became laced with frost. Breaking branches, ragged breath punctuated with gasping sobs, light footsteps crashing through the bramble and brush, a horse's thunderous gait closing in. Aelin made herself stand still when that familiar, frozen wood appeared, exactly as she remembered it. As she appeared, so small and young, white nightgown torn and muddy, hair wild, 
eyes bright with terror and grief so profound it had broken her entirely. Frantic to reach the roaring river beyond. The bridge. There were the posts. And the forest on the other side. Her sanctuary. Manon swore softly as Aelin Galathinius flung herself through the bridge posts, realized the bridge had been cut, and plummeted into the raging, half-frozen river below. She had forgotten how far that fall was, how violent the black river was, the white rapids illuminated by the icy moon overhead. The image shifted, and then it was dark and silent, and they were being tumbled over and over as the river tossed her in its wrath. There was so much death, Elena whispered as she watched Aelin being thrown and twisted and dragged down by the river. The cold was crushing. So much death, and so many lights extinguished, Elena said, voice breaking. You were so small, and you fought. You fought so hard. And there she was, clawing at the water, kicking and thrashing, trying to get to the surface, to the air, and she could feel her lungs begin to seize, feel the pressure building. Then light flickered from the amulet of Orinth hanging around her neck, greenish symbols fizzing like bubbles around her. Elena slid to her knees, watching that amulet glow beneath the water. They wanted me to take you right then. You had the amulet of Orinth. Everyone thought you were dead. And the enemy was distracted with the slaughter. I could take you, help you track down the other two keys. I was allowed to help you, to do that much. And once we got the other two, I was to force you to forge the lock anew, to use every last drop of you to make that lock, summon the gate, put the keys back into it, send them home, and end it all. You had enough power, even then. It'd kill you to do it, but you were likely dead anyway. So they let me form a body to get you. Elena took a shuddering breath as a figure plunged into the water, a silver-haired, beautiful woman in an ancient dress. She grabbed Aelin around the waist, hauling her up, up, up. They hit the surface of the river, and it was dark and loud and wild, and it was all she could do to grab the long the log Elena shoved into her arm. To dig her nails into the soaked wood and cling to it while she was carried down river, deep into the night. I hesitated, Elena breathed. You clung to that log with all your strength. Everything had been taken away from you. Everything. And yet you still fought. You did not yield. And they told me to hurry, because even then their power to hold me in that solid body was fading. They said to just take you and go, but I hesitated. I waited until you got to that riverbank. Mud and reeds and trees looming overhead, snow still patching the steep hill of the bank. Aelin watched herself crawl up that river bank, inch by painful inch, and she felt the phantom icy mud beneath her hands, felt her broken, frozen body as it slumped onto the earth and shuddered, over and over, as lethal cold gripped her while Elena hauled herself onto the bank beside her. As Elena lunged for her, screaming her name, cold and shock setting in. I thought the danger would be drowning, Elena whispered. I didn't realize being out in the cold for so long. Her lips had gone blue. Aelin watched her own small chest rise, fall, rise, then stop moving altogether. You died, Elena whispered. Right there, you died. You had fought so hard, and I failed you. And in that moment, I didn't care that I'd again failed the gods, or my promise to make it right, or any of it. All I could think. Tears ran down Elena's face. All I could think was of how unfair it was. How you had not even lived. You had not even been given a chance. And all those people, who had wished and waited for a better world, you would not be there to give it to them. Oh, gods. Elena. Aelin breathed. The Queen of Adderlin sobbed into her hands, even as her former self shook Aelin over and over, trying to wake her, trying to revive the small body that had given out. 
Elena's voice broke. I could not allow it. I could not endure it. Not for the gods' sake, but, but for your own. Light flared at Elena's hand, then down her arm, then along her whole body. Fire. She wrapped herself around Aelin, the heat melting the snow around them, drying her ice-crusted hair. Lips that were blue turned pink, and a chest that had stopped breathing now lifted. Darkness faded to the gray light of dawn. And then I defied them. Elena set her down between the reeds and rose, scanning the river, the world. I knew who had an estate near this river, so far away from your home that your parents had tolerated its presence as long as he was not stupid enough to stir up trouble. Elena, a mere flicker of light, tugged Arobin from a deep sleep inside his former residence in Terrason. As if in a trance, he shoved on his boots, his red hair gleaming in the light of dawn, mounted his horse, and set off into the woods. So young, her former master. Only a few years older than she was now. Arabin's horse paused as if an invisible hand had yanked its bridle, and the assassin scanned the raging river, the trees, as if looking for something he didn't even know was there. But there was Elena. Invisible as sunlight, crouching in the reeds when Arabin's eyes fell upon the small, dirty figure unconscious on the riverbank. He leaped from his horse with feline grace, sit slinging off his cloak as he drew himself to his knees in the mud and felt for her breathing. I knew what he was, what he'd likely do with you, what training you would receive. But it was better than dead. And if you could survive, if you could grow up strong, if you had the chance to reach adulthood, I thought perhaps you could give those people who had wished and dreamed of a better world. At least give them a chance. Help them before the debt was called in again. Arabin's hands hesitated as he noticed the amulet of Orinth. He eased the amulet from around her neck and placed it in his pocket. Gently, he scooped her into his arms and carried her up the bank to his waiting horse. You were so young. Elena said again. And more than the dreamers, more than the dead. I wanted to give you time, to at least know what it was to live. Aelin rasped. What was the price, Elena? What did they do to you for this? Elena wrapped her arms around herself as the image faded, Arobin mounting his horse, Aelin in his arms. Mist swirled again. When it is done, Elena managed to say, I go too. For the time I bought you, when this game is finished, my soul will be melted back into the darkness. I will not see Gavin, or my children, or my friends. I will be gone. Forever. Did you know that before you... Yes. They told me over and over, but I couldn't. I couldn't do it. Aelin slid to her knees before the queen, took Elena's tear-stained face between her hands. Nameless is my price, Aelin said, her voice breaking. Elena nodded. The mirror was just that, a mirror, a ploy to get you here, so that you could understand everything we did. Just a bit of metal and glass, Elena had said when Aelin had summoned her in Skull's Bay. But now you are here, and have seen. Now you comprehend the cost. To forge the lock anew. To put the three keys back in the gate. A mark glowed on Aelin's brow, heating her skin. The bastard mark of Brannon. The mark of the nameless. Mala's blood must be spent. Your power must be spent. Every drop of magic, of blood... You are the cost to make a new lock, and seal the keys into the gate, to make the word gate whole. Aelin said softly, I know. She had known for some time now, had been preparing for it as best she could, preparing things for the others. Aelin said to the queen, I have two keys. If I can find the third, steal it from Erewhon. Will you come with me? Help me end it once and for all. Will you come with me 
so I will not be alone. El Elena nodded, but whispered, I'm sorry. Aelin lowered her hands from the queen's face, took a deep, shuddering breath. Why didn't you tell me from the start? Behind them, she had the vague sense that Manon was quietly assessing. You were barely climbing out of slavery, Elena had said, hardly holding yourself together, trying so hard to pretend that you were still strong and whole. There was only so much I could do to guide you, nudge you along. The mirror was forged and hidden to one day show you all of this. In a way, I couldn't tell you. Not when I could only manage a few minutes at a time. Why did you tell me to go to Wendelin? Maeve poses as great a threat as Erewhon. Glacier blue eyes met hers at last. I know. Maeve has long wished to regain possession of the keys. My father believed it was for something other than conquest. Something darker. Worse. I don't know why she only began hunting for them once you arrived, but I sent you to Wendelin for the healing. And so you would... find him. The one who had been waiting so long for you. Aelin's heart cracked. Rowan. Elena nodded. He was a voice in the void. A secret, silent dreamer. And so were his companions. But the Fey Prince, he was... Aelin reigned in her sob. I know. I've known for a long time. I wanted you to know that joy, too, Elena whispered, however briefly. I did, Aelin managed to say. Thank you. Elena covered her face at those words, shuddering. But after a moment, she surveyed Aelin, then Manon, still silent and watching. The witch mirror's power is fading. It will not hold you here for much longer. Please, let me show you what must be done. How to end it. You won't be able to see me after, but I will be with you. Until the very end. Every step of the way, I will be with you. Manon only put a hand on her sword as Aelin swallowed and said, Show me then. So Elena did. And when she was done, Aelin was silent. Manon was pacing, snarling softly. But Aelin did not fight it as Elena leaned in to kiss her brow where that damning mark had been her whole life. A bit of chattel, branded for the slaughterhouse. Brandon's mark. The mark of the bastard born. The nameless. Nameless is my price. To buy them a future, she'd pay it. She'd done as much as she could to set things in motion, to ensure that once she was gone, help would still come. It was the only thing she could give them. Her last gift to Terrison to those she loved with her heart of wildfire. Elena stroked her cheek. Then the ancient queen and the mists were gone. Sunlight flooded them, blinding Aelin and Manon so violently that they hissed and slammed into each other. The brine of the sea, crash of nearby waves, and rustle of sea grasses greeting them. And beyond that, distantly, the clamor and bellowing of all-out war. They were on the outskirts of the marshes, upon the lip of the sea itself, the battle miles and miles out to sea. They must have traveled within the mists, somehow. A soft female laugh slithered through the grass. Aelin knew that laugh. I knew that somehow, perhaps, they had not traveled through the mists. But they had been placed here, by whatever forces were at work, whatever gods watching. To stand in the sandy field before the turquoise sea, dead guards in briarcliff armor slaughtered upon the nearby dunes, still bleeding out. To stand before Queen Maeve of the Fey, a lead locking on her knees before her, with a Fey warrior's blade at her throat. And that was chapter 68. Oh my gosh. Do you need tissues? Oh, I cried. I know, I heard you sniffling back there. <sighs> Hi, Hounds! Thank you for the sub. Also, thank you for waiting until the chapter ended. I don't know how long you've been here for, waiting for me to finish. Uh, but thank you for that. Also, for the Prime sub for 21 months, it has been a minute. 
It's good to see you too, Houts. It's good to see you too. Um, well, Angela, you missed one hell of a chapter. You missed one hell of a chapter. That was crazy, guys. That was crazy. Also, just want to announce real quick. We surpassed 2,000 subscribers on YouTube. I checked today, and it's at 2001, so I'm assuming we surpassed it at some point today. Um, so yeah, that's crazy. Thank you, everybody, so much for your support. We have surpassed 2000. I never thought I would get to this point. I really did it. It's kind of surreal to think about it, that I have, at minimum, 2,000 people watching my videos. I know I have more than that, because there's a lot of people in my statistics show that are not subscribed. Uh, which I get. But I mean, if, you, if you're able to click that subscribe button, click that subs subscribe button. It really does mean a lot. Anyways, I also want to address that I had two comments on the last video saying how they thought it was hilarious um, and loved how I will read through a very intense chapter and then change tune at the end and immediately just happily, joyfully say, and that was chapter 68. <laughs> So, I think that was funny. There were two comments by two different people at the same time about that. And I think it was quite comical. Um, and, I, and I'm glad I'm glad they all appreciate my mom guests. Yeah, there was a lot of comments about mom's reaction, her what, in the last video uh, at the end of a chapter. And everybody was like, staying for the mom reactions. <laughs> um, but yeah. Thank you. Essentially, just wanted to say thank you, everybody, for the 2,000 subscribers. I forgot to say it in the beginning of the video. Um, Guys, that chapter took us, like, almost half an hour to read. That was a long did make chapter. A... <laughs> did you make a sound bite? I did not, but I, I, because I, I don't know how, but I want to find the timestamp of that in the last recording. Um, I, I know it was, like, after one of the intense chapters. I just don't remember which one. Oh, that's um, awesome. That's so funny. And, and I want to send it to my friend who does sound engineering stuff and have her oh make God. me <laughs> a sound bite of it. <laughs> so I can put it on my stream deck and just be like, what? <laughs> I would use that way more than just the oh. reading streams. I would just be in a Discord call and just that's fucking great. press the button and it's just mom going, what? It'd be thing, funny. You know, there's something that, you know, some, some social media thing of all of a sudden people are using the what? And some yep. Stuff. Yep. <laughs> um, <sighs> bye, house. Thank you for stopping by. Anyways, without further ado, we need to keep rolling through these oh, chapters. Keep yeah. rolling through these chapters. I don't know if we're going to finish this book today because that was a long ass chapter. <clears throat> oh, hold on. Before I start, cat ears for the next chapter. Oh, how did I miss that? It literally just popped up. Oh. Like, just now. Like, oh, just as I said, okay. let's get back into it and look down. I saw it pop up, so. They're a little crooked, but that's fine. <clears throat> okay. Chapter 69. Adian had faced armies. Faced death more times than he could count. But this, even with what Rowan had done... The enemy ships still outnumbered them. The battling between ships had become too dangerous. The magic wielders too aware of Lysandra to allow her to attack beneath the waves. She was now fighting viciously beside Adian in ghost leopard form, taking down whatever fey warriors tried to board their ship. Whatever soldiers made it through the shredding gauntlet of Rowan's and Dorian's magic. His father had left. Fenris and Lorcan too. He'd last seen his father on the quarter deck of one of the ships that had been under his command, a sword in each hand, the lion poised for the kill. And as if sensing Adian's gaze, a wall of golden light had wrapped around him. Adian wasn't stupid enough to demand Gavriel take it away, not as the shield shrank and shrank, until it covered Adian like a second skin. Minutes later, Gavriel was gone, vanished, but that magic shield remained. That had been the start of the sharp turn they'd taken, going back on the defensive as sheer numbers and immortal versus mortal fighting took its toll on their fleet. 
He had no doubt Maeve had something to do with it. But that bitch wasn't his problem. No. His problem was the armada all around him. His problem was the fact that the enemy soldiers he engaged were highly trained and didn't go down easily. His problem was that his sword arm ached. His shield was embedded with arrows and dented, and still more of those ships stretched away into the distance. He did not let himself think about Aelin, about where she was. His fey instincts pricked at the rumble of Rowan's and Dorian's magic surging up, then snapping into the enemy flank. Ships broke in the wake of that power. Warriors drowned beneath the weight of their armor. Their own ship rocked back from the one they'd been engaging thanks to the flood of power and Aiden used the reprieve to whirl to Lysandra. Blood from his own wounds and ones he'd inflicted covered him, mixing with the sweat running down his skin. He said to the shifter, I want you to run. Lysandra turned a fuzzy head toward him, pale green eyes narrowing slightly. Blood and gore dripped from her maw onto the wooden planks. Aiden held that gaze. You turn into a bird or a moth, or a fish. I don't run in care. And you go. If we're about to fall, you run. That's an order. She hissed, as if to say, you don't give me orders. I technically outrank you, he said, slashing his sword down his shield to clear it of two protruding arrows as they again swung in toward the another ship, crammed full of well-rested fey warriors. So you'll run, or I'll kick your ass in the afterworld. Lysandra stalked up to him. A lesser man might have backed away from a predator that big, prowling close. Some of his soldiers did. But Adian held his ground as she rose on her back legs, those huge paws settling on his shoulders, and brought her blooded, bloodied feline face up to his. Her wet whiskers twitched. Lysandra leaned in and nuzzled his cheek, his neck. Then she trotted back to her place, blood splashing beneath her silent paws. When she deigned to glance his way, spitting blood onto the deck, Adian said softly, The next time, do that in your human form. Her puffy tail just curled a bit in answer. But their ship rocked back toward their latest attacker. The temperature plummeted, either from Rowan or Dorian or one of the white horn nobles. Adian couldn't tell. They'd been lucky that Maeve had brought a fleet whose magic wielders hailed mostly from Rowan's line. Adian braced himself, spreading apart his feet as wind and ice tore into the enemy lines. Fey soldiers, perhaps ones Rowan himself had commanded, screamed. But Rowan and Dorian struck relentlessly. Line after line, Rowan and Dorian blasted their power into Maeve's fleet. Yet more ships flooded past them, engaging Adian and the others. Ansel of Briarcliff held the left flank, and... The lines remained steady even if Maeve's armada still outnumbered them. The first phase soldier who cleared the railing of their ship headed right for Lysandra. It was the last mistake the male made. She leaped, dodging past his guard, and closed her jaws around his neck. Bone crunched, and blood sprayed. Adian leaped forward to engage the next soldier over the railing, cutting through the grappling hooks that arced and landed true. Adian loosed himself into a killing calm, an eye on the shifter, who took down soldier after soldier, his father's gold shield holding strong around her, too. Death rained upon him. Adian did not let himself think about how many were left, how many Rowan and Dorian felled, the ruins of ships sinking around them, blood and flotsam choking the sea. So Adian kept killing, and killing, and killing. Dorian's breath burned his throat. His magic was sluggish. A headache pulsed at his temples. But he kept unleashing his power upon the enemy lines while soldiers fought and died around him. So many. So many trained warriors, a scant few of whom were blessed with magic, and had been wielding it to get past them. He didn't dare see how the others were faring. All he heard were roars and snarls of wrath, shrieks of dying people, and the crack of wood and the snap of rope. Clouds had formed and gathered above, blocking out the sun. His magic sang as it froze the life out of ships, out of soldiers, as it battled in their death, as it bathed in their death. But it still flagged. 
He'd lost track of how long it had been. Still, they kept coming. And still, Manon and Aelin did not return. Rowan held the front line, weapons ankled, ready for any soldiers stupid enough to approach. But too many broke past their magic. Too many now steadily overwhelmed them. As soon as he thought it, Adian's bark of pain cut across the waves. There was a roar of rage that echoed it. Was Adian? The coppery tang of blood coated Dorian's mouth. The burnout. Another roar, deep and bellowing, cleaved the world. Dorian braced himself, rallying his magic perhaps for the last time. That roar sounded again as a mighty shape shot down from the heavy clouds. A wyvern. A wyvern with shimmering wings. And behind it, descending upon the fey fleet with wicked delight, flew twelve others. And that was chapter 69. Um, Angela, to answer your, um, chat, because you didn't catch the beginning part of that first chapter, um, no, Maeve did not kill them when they vanished, or his dad. That was them entering the mirror. Um, they, they, or I think it was like the end of last chapter or something. They entered the mirror. So that was them in the mirror. Um, so them coming back was them leaving the mirror. We'll wrap it up listening and it means either with the ship and um they're now on a beach instead of returning on the ship like they were supposed to they're now on the beach where queen Maeve is with a lead um so yeah no 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 it's it was it's them going into the mirror Iron and fire together bound silver. Fire is Aelin. Iron is Manon. So when they joined hands and touched the mirror, it activated it and it transported them into this void-like space. Um, and then once the power of the mirror was done, they were transported out. On to chapter 70. Um, Lysandra knew that roar. And then there was a Braxos, plunging from the heavy clouds, twelve other wyverns and riders behind him, iron teeth witches. Hold your fire! Rowan bellowed from half a dozen ships away, at the archers who had trained their few remaining arrows on the golden-haired witch closest to a Braxos, her pale blue wyvern shrieking a war cry. The other witches and their wyverns unleashed hell upon the fae, smashing through the converging lines, snapping grappling ropes, buying them a moment's reprieve. How they know who to attack? What side to fight for? Abraxos and eleven others angled northward in one smooth movement, then plowed into the panicking army fleet. Pa pa panicking enemy fleet. The golden-haired rider, however, swept for Lysandra's ship, her sky-blue wyvern gracefully landing on the prow. The witch was beautiful, a strip of black braided leather across her brow, and she called to none of them in particular. Where is Manon Blackbeak? Who are you? Adian demanded, his voice a rasp, but there was recognition in his eyes, as if remembering that day at Temis's temple. The witch grinned, revealing white teeth, but iron glinted at her fingertips. Aster and Blackbeak, at your service. She scanned the embattled ships. Where is Manan? A Braxos led. It's a long story, but she's here. Adian shouted over the din. Lysandra crept closer, sizing up the witch, the coven that was now wreaking havoc upon the fey lines. You and your thirteen save our asses, witch, Adian said, and I'll tell you anything you damn want. A wicked grin and an incline of her head. Then we shall clear the field for you. Then Asterin and the Wyvern soared up and blasted between the waves, spearing for where the others were fighting. At Asterin's approach, the Wyverns and riders reeled back, rising high into the air, falling into formation, a hammer about to strike. The Fae knew it, 
They began throwing up feeble shields, shooting wildly for them, their panic making their aim sloppy. But the wyverns were covered in armor, efficient, beautiful armor. The thirteen laughed at their enemy as they slammed into its th southern flank. Lysander wished she had the strength left to shift, one last time, to join them in that glorious destruction. The thirteen herded the panicking ships between them, smashed them apart, wielding every weapon in their arsenal, wyverns, blades, iron teeth. What got past them received the brutal mercy of Rowan's and Dorian's magic. And what got past that magic? Lysandra found Adian's blood-splattered stare. The general prince smirked in that insolent way of his, sending a thrill wilder than bloodlust through her. We don't want the witches to make us look bad, do we? Lysandra returned his smirk and lunged back into the fray. Not many more. Rowan's magic was strained to the breaking point, his panic a dull roaring in the back of his mind, but he kept attacking, kept swinging his blades at any that got past his wind and ice, or Dorian's own blasts of raw, unchecked power. Fenris, Lorcan, and Gavriel had bolted an hour or lifetimes ago, vanishing to wherever Maeve had no doubt summoned them. But the Armada held fast. Whoever Ansel of Briarcliff's men were, they weren't cowed by fey warriors, and they were no strangers to bloodshed. Neither were Wolf's men. None of them ran. The Thirteen continued to wreak havoc on Maeve's panicking fleet, Aster and fleet, and Aster and Blackbeak barked commands high above them the twelve witches breaking the enemy lines with fierce, clever determination. If this was how one coven fought, then an army of them. Rowan gritted his teeth as the remaining ships decided to be smarter than their dead companions and began to peel away. If Maeve gave the order to retreat, too bad, too damn bad, he'd send her own ship down to the inky black himself. He gave Astrin a sharp whistle the next time she passed overhead, rallying her thirteen again. She whistled back in confirmation. The thirteen launched after the fleeing armada. The battle ebbed, red waves laden with debris flowing past on the swift tide. Rowan gave the order to the captain to hold the lines and deal with any stupidity from Maeve's armada if any ships decided not to turn tail. His legs trembling. His arms shaking so badly he was afraid that if he let go of his weapons, he wouldn't be able to pick them up again. Rowan shifted and soared high. His cousins had joined the Thirteen in their pursuit of the fleet now trying to run. He avoided the urge to count. But Rowan flew higher, scanning. There was one boat missing. A boat he'd sailed on, worked on, thought on in past wars and journeys. Maeve's personal battleship the Nightingale, was nowhere to be seen. Not within the retreating fleet, now fending off the White Thorn Royals and the Thirteen. Not within the sinking hulks of ships now bleeding out in the water. Rowan's blood chilled. But he dove fast and hard for Adian in Lysandra's ship, where Gore covered the deck so thickly it rippled as he shifted and sat down in it. Adian was covered in blood, both his own and others. Lysandra was purging a stomach full of it. Rowan managed to will his legs into maneuvering around fallen Fay. He did not look too closely at their faces. Is she back? Adian instantly demanded, wincing as he put weight on his thigh. Rowan surveyed his brother's wound. He'd have to heal him soon, as soon as his magic replenished. In a place like this, even Adian's Fay blood couldn't keep the infection away long. I don't know, Rowan said. Find her, Adian growled. He broke Rowan's stare only to watch Lysander shift into her human form and ran an eye over the injuries that peppered her skin. Rowan's skin tightened over his bones. He had the feeling that the ground was about to slip from under his feet as Dorian appeared at the rail of the main deck, gaunt-faced and haggard, no doubt having used the last of his magic to propel a longboat over and panted. The coast. Aelin is out by the coast where we sent a lead. They all are. That was miles away. How the hell had they gotten there? How do you know? Lysandra demanded, tying back her hair with bloody fingers. Because I can feel something out there, Dorian said. Flame and shadow and death. Like Lorcan and Elide and someone else. Someone ancient. Powerful. 
Rowan braced himself for it, but he still wasn't ready for the pure terror when Dorian added, And female. Maeve had found them. The battle had not been for any sort of victory or conquest, but a distraction. While Maeve slipped away to get the real prize. They'd never arrive fast enough. If he flew on his own, his magic already drained to the breaking point. He would be of little help. They stood a better chance. Aelin stood a better chance, if they were all there. Rowan whirled to the horizon behind them, to the wyverns destroying the remnants of the fleet. Rowing would take too long. His magic was gutted, but a wyvern. That might do. And that was chapter 70. Of everything that went into getting them all to this point. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And just think, we still got one more book. Not every, not everybody's converged yet. I know. There's still more people that are gonna converge together. I know. Still more intertwined stories. Okay. <clears throat> On to chapter 71. The Queen of the Fae was exactly as Aelin remembered. Swirling dark robes, a beautiful pale face beneath onyx hair, red lips set in a faint smile. No crown adorned her head, for all who breathed, even the dead who slumbered, would know her for what she was. Dreams and nightmares given form, the dark face of the moon. And kneeling before Maeve, a stone-faced sentry holding a blade to her bare throat. A lead trembled. Her guards, all men in Ansel's armor, had likely been killed before they could shout a warning. From the weapons that were only half out of their sheaths, they hadn't even had the chance to fight. Manon had gone still as death at the sight of a lead, her iron nail sliding free. Aelin forced a half-smile to her mouth, shoved her raw, bleeding heart into a box deep inside her chest, not as impressive as Dora now, if you ask me. But at least a swamp really reflects your true nature, you know. It'll be a wonderful new home for you. Definitely worth the cost of coming all this way to conquer it. At the edge of the hill that flowed down to the beach, a small party of fey warriors monitored them. Male and female. All armed. All strangers. A massive, elegant ship idled in the calm bay beyond. Maeve smiled slightly. What a joy to learn that your usual good spirits remain undimmed in such dark days. How could they not, when so many of your pretty males are in my company? Maeve cocked her head, her heavy curtain of dark hair sliding off a shoulder. Forgot I don't need this anymore. <laughs> and as if in answer, Lorcan appeared at the edge of the dunes, panting, wild-eyed, sword out. His focus, and horror, Aelin realized, on a lead. On the sentry holding the blade against her white neck. Maeve gave a little smile to the warrior, but looked to Manon. With her attention elsewhere, Lorcan took up a place at Aelin's side, as if they were somehow allies in this, would fight back to back. Aelin didn't bother to say anything to him, not as Maeve said to the witch, I know your face. The face that remained cold and impassive. Let the girl go. A small, breathy laugh. Ah! Aelin's stomach clenched at that ancient focus shifted to a lead. Claimed by queen and witch and... My second, it seems. Aelin tensed. She didn't think Lorcan was breathing beside her. Maeve toyed with a strand of a lead's limp hair. The Lady of Paranx shook. The girl who Lorcan Salvatare summoned me to save. That ripple of Lorcan's power the day Ansel's fleet had closed in. She'd known it was a summoning. The same way she'd summoned the Vogue to, Skull, to Skull's Bay. She'd refused to immediately explain Ansel's presence, wanting to enjoy the surprise of it. And he had summoned Maeve's armada to take on what he'd believed to be an enemy fleet. To save a lead. Lorcan just said, I'm sorry. Aelin didn't know if it was to her or a lead, whose eyes now widened with outrage. But Aelin said, Do you think I didn't know? 
that I didn't take precautions? Lorcan's brows furrowed. Aelin shrugged. But Maeve went on. Lady Alid Larkin, daughter of Kael and Marion Larkin. No wonder the witch itches to retrieve you, if her bloodline runs in your veins. Manon snarled a warning. Aelin drawled to the Fey Queen. Well, you didn't drag your ancient carcass all the way here for nothing, so let's get on with it. What do you want for the girl? That adder smile curled Maeve's lips again. Alid was trembling. Every bone, every pore was trembling in terror at the immortal queen standing above her, at the guard's blade at her throat. The rest of the queen's escort remained distant. But it was to the escort that Lorcan kept glancing, his face tight, his own body near shaking with restrained wrath. This was the queen to whom he'd given his heart, this cold creature who looked at the world with mirthless eyes, who had killed those soldiers without a blink of hesitation. The queen whom Lorcan had summoned for her. He brought Maeve to save her. Elide's breath turned sharp in her throat. He'd betrayed them. Betrayed Aelin for her. What should I demand as payment for the girl? Maeve mused, taking a few steps toward them, graceful as a moonbeam. Why doesn't my second tell me? So busy, Lorcan. You've been so, so busy these months. His voice was hoarse as he lowered his head. I did it for you, Majesty. Then where is my ring? Where are my keys? A ring. Alive was willing to bet it was was willing to bet it was the golden one on her own finger, hidden beneath her other hand as she clenched them before her. But Lorcan pointed his chin toward Aelin. She has them. Two keys. Cold clanged through Alid. Lorcan. The guard's blade twitched at her throat. Aelin only leveled a cool stare at Lorcan. He didn't look at either Elid or Elena, or Aelin. Didn't so much as acknowledge their existence as he went on. Aelin has two, and probably has a good inkling where Erewhon hides the third. Lorcan! Elid pleaded. No. No, he wasn't about to do this. About to betray them again. Be quiet, he growled at her. Maeve's gaze again drifted down to Elid. The ancient, eternal darkness in it was smothering. What familiarity you use when you speak his name, Lady of Haranth. What intimacy. Aelin's little snort was her only warning sign. Don't you have better things to do than terrorize humans? Release the girl and let's settle this the fun way. Flame danced at Aelin's fingertips. No. Her magic had been emptied, still hovered near burnout. But Aelin stepped forward, nudging Manon with the side of her body as she passed, forcing the witch to step to back away. Aelin grinned. Want to dance, Maeve? But Aelin shot a cutting glance over her shoulder at Manon, as if to say, Run. Grab a lead the moment Maeve's guard is down, and run. Maeve returned Aelin's smile. I don't think you'd be a suitable dance partner right now. Not when your magic is nearly depleted. Did you think my arrival was merely dependent upon Lorcan's summoning? Who do you think even whispered to Morath that you were indeed down here? Of course, the fools didn't realize that when you had drained yourself on their armies, I'd be waiting. You were already exhausted after putting out the fires I had my armada ignite to tire you out on Eelway's coast. It was a convenience that Lorcan gave your precise location and saved me the energy of tracking you down myself. A trap. An enormous, wicked trap to drain Aelin's power over days, weeks. But Aelin lifted a brow. You brought an entire armada just to start a few fires? I brought an armada to see if you'd rise to the occasion, which apparently Prince Rowan has done. Hope soared in Elide's chest. But then Maeve said, The armada was a precaution just in case the Ilkin didn't arrive for you to wholly drain yourself. I figured a few hundred ships would make for good kindling until I was ready. To sacrifice her own fleet, or part of it, to gain one prize? This, mad this was madness. The queen was utterly insane. Do something, Alid hissed at Lorcan, at Manon. 
do something. Neither of them responded. The flame around Aelin's fingers grew to encompass her hand, then her arm as she said to the ancient queen. All I hear is a lot of chit-chat. Maeve glanced at her escort, and they stepped away, hauled a lead with them, the blades still at her throat. Aelin said sharply to Manon, Get out of range. The witch fell back, but her eyes were on the guard holding the lead, gobbling down every detail she could. You can't possibly hope to win, Maeve said, as if they were about to play cards. At least we'll enjoy ourselves until the end, Aelin crooned back, flame now encasing her entirely. Oh, I have no interest in killing you, Maeve purred. Then they exploded. Flame slammed outward, red and golden, just as a wall of darkness lashed for Aelin. The impact shook the world. Even Manon was thrown on her ass. But Lorcan was already moving. The guard holding Alid showered her hair with blood as Lorcan slit his throat. The other two guards behind him died with a hatchet to the face, one after another. Alid surged up, her leg barking in pain, running for Manon on pure, blind instinct, but Lorcan gripped her by the collar of her tunic. Stupid fool, he snapped, and she clawed at him. Lorcan, hold the girl, Maeve said quietly, not even looking toward them. Don't get any stupid ideas about fleeing with her. He went utterly still, his hold tightening. Maeve and Aelin struck again, light and darkness. Sand shuddered down the dunes. The waves rippled. Only now. Maeve had only dared attack Aelin now. Because Aelin at her full strength. Aelin could beat her. But Aelin? Nearly depleted of her power? Please, Alid begged Lorcan. But he held her firm. Slave to the order Maeve had given. One eye on the battling queens. The other on the escorts who weren't foolish enough to approach after witnessing what he'd done to their companions. Run, Lorcan said in her ear. If you wish to live, run, Alid. Shove me off. Work around her command. Push me and run. She would not. She'd sooner die than flee like a coward. Not when Aelin was going to the mat for all of them. When darkness devoured flame. And even Manon flinched as Aelin was slammed back. A paper-thin wall of flame kept that darkness from hitting home. A wall that wavered. Help. They needed help. Maeve lashed to the left, and Aelin threw up a hand, fire deflecting. Aelin didn't see the blow to the right. Alid screamed in warning, but too late. A whip of black sliced into Aelin. She went down. And Alid thought the impact of Aelin Galathinius's knees hitting the sand might have been the most horrible sound she had ever heard. Maeve did not waste her advantage. Darkness poured down, pounding again and again. Aelin deflected, but it got past her. There was nothing a lead could do as Aelin screamed, as that dark, ancient power struck her like a hammer over an anvil. A lead begged Manon, now mere feet away. Do something! Manon ignored her, eyes fixed on the battle before them. Aelin crawled backward, blood sliding from her right nostril, dripping on her white shirt. Maeve advanced, the darkness swirling around her like a fell wind. Aelin tried to rise. Tried, but her legs had given out. The Queen of Terrison panted, fire flickering like dying embers around her. Maeve pointed with a finger. A black whip, faster than Aelin's fire, lashed out, wrapped around her throat. Aelin gripped it, thrashing, her teeth bared, flame flaring over and over. Why don't you use the keys, Aelin? Maeve purred. Surely you'd win that way. Use them, Alid begged her. Use them! But Aelin did not. The coil of darkness tightened around Aelin's throat. Flames sparked and died out. Then the darkness expanded, encompassing Aelin again and squeezing tight. Squeezing until she was screaming, screaming in a way that Alid knew meant unfathomable agony. A low, vicious snarl rippled from nearby, the only warning as a massive wolf leapt 
through, leaped through the seagrass and shifted. Fenris. A heartbeat later, a mountain lion charged over a dune, beheld the scene, and shifted as well. Gavriel. Let her go, Fenris growled at the Dark Queen, advancing a step. Let her go now! Maeve turned her head, that darkness still lashing Aelin. Look who finally arrived. Another set of traitors. She smoothed a wrinkle in her flowing gown. What a valiant effort you made, Fenris, delaying your arrival on this beach for as long as you could withstand my summons. She clicked her tongue. Did you enjoy playing loyal subject while panting after the young queen of fire? As if an answer, the darkness squeezed in tight, and Aelin screamed again. Stop it! Fenris snapped. Maeve, please, Gabriel said, exposing his palms to her. Maeve, the queen crooned, not majesty. Has the lion gone a bit feral? Perhaps too much time with his unchecked half-breed bastard? Leave him out of this, Gabriel said too softly. But Maeve let the darkness around Aelin part. She was curled on her side, bleeding from both nostrils now more blood dribbling from her panting mouth. Fenris lunged for her. A wall of black slammed up between them. I don't think so, Maeve crooned. Aelin gasped for air, eyes glassy with pain, eyes that slid to a lead's. Aelin's body, bloody, chapped mouth, formed the word again. Run. She would not. Could not. Aelin's arms shook as she tried to rise herself. And Elide knew there was no magic left. No fire left in the queen. Not one ember. And the only way Aelin could face this, accept this, was to go down swinging. Like Marion had. Aelin's wet, rasping breaths were the only sound above the crashing waves behind them. Even the battle had gone quiet in the distance. Over. Or perhaps they were all dead. Manon still stood there. Still did not move. Alid begged her. Please, please. Maeve smiled at the witch. I have no quarrel with you, Blackbeak. Stay out of this and you are free to go where you wish. Please, Alid pleaded. Manon's gold eyes were hard, cold. She nodded to Maeve. Agreed. Something in Alid's chest cleaved open. But Gavriel said from across their little circle, Majesty, please, leave Aelin Galathinius to her own war here. Let us return home. Home? Maeve asked. The black wall between Fenris and Aelin lowered, but the warrior did not try to cross. He just stared at Aelin, stared at her in that way Elide herself must be looking. He didn't break that stare until Maeve said to Gabriel, Is Dornell still your home? Yes, Majesty, Gabriel said calmly. It is an honor to call it such. Honor, Maeve mused. Yes, you and honor go hand in hand, don't they? But what of the honor of your vow, Gabriel? I have kept my vow to you. Did I or did I not tell you to execute Lorcan on sight? There were circumstances that prevented it from happening. We tried. Yet you failed. Am I not supposed to discipline my blood bonded who fail me? Gavriel lowered his head. Of course, we will accept it, and I will also take on the punishment you intended for Aelin Galathinius. Aelin lifted her head slightly, glazed eyes going wide. She tried to speak, but the words had been broken from her, her voice blown out from screaming. Elid knew the word the queen mouthed. No. Not for her. Elid wondered if Gavriel's sacrifice was not only for Aelin's sake, but for Adian's, so the son would not have to bear the pain of his queen being hurt. Aelin Galathinius, Maeve mused. So much talk about Aelin Galathinius, the queen who was promised. Well, Gavriel, a vicious smile, if you're so invested in her court, why don't you join it? Fenris tensed, preparing to lunge in front of the dark power for his friend. But Maeve said, 
I sever the blood oath with you, Gabriel. Without honor, without good faith, you are dismissed from my service and stripped of your title. You bitch, Fenris snapped as Gabriel's breathing turned shallow. Majesty, please, Gabriel hissed, clapping a hand over his arm as invisible claws raked two lines down his skin, drawing blood that spilled into the grass. A similar mark appeared on Maeve's arm, her blood spilling. It is done, she said simply. Let the world know you, a male of honor, have none, that you betrayed your queen for another, for a bastard get of yours. Gabriel stumbled back, then clasped collapsed in the sand. A hand shoved against his chest. Fenris snarled, his face more lupine than Fay. but Maeve laughed softly. Oh, you'd like for me to do the same, wouldn't you, Fenris? But what greater punishment for the one who was a traitor to me in his very soul than to serve me forever? Fenris hissed, his breath coming in ragged gulps, and Alid wondered if he'd leap upon the queen and try to kill her. But Maeve turned to Aelin and said, Get up. Aelin tried. Her body failed her. Maeve clicked her tongue, an invisible hand hauled Aelin to her feet. Pain fogged eyes cleared, then filled with cold rage as Aelin took in the approaching queen. An assassin, Alid reminded herself. Aelin was an assassin, and if Maeve got close enough. But Maeve didn't and those invisible hands cut the tethers on Aelin's sword belts. Goldrin thunked to the ground, then daggers slid from their sheaths. So many weapons, Maeve contemplated, as the invisible hands disarmed Aelin with brutal efficiency. Even blades hidden beneath clothes found their way out, slicing as they went. Blood bloomed beneath Aelin's shirt and pants. Why did she stand there? Gathering her strength, for one last strike, one last stand. Let the queen believe her broken. Why? Aelin rasped, buying herself time. Maeve towed a fallen dagger, the blade edged with Aelin's blood. Why bother with you at all? Because I can't very well let you sacrifice yourself to forge a new lock, can I? Not when you already have what I want. And I have known for a very, very long time that you would give me what I seek, Aelin Galathinius, and have taken the steps toward ensuring that. Aelin breathed. What? Maeve said. Haven't you figured it out? Why I wanted your mother to bring you to me? Why I demanded such things of you this spring? None of them dared move. Maeve snorted, a delicate feminine sound of triumph. Brandon stole the keys from me after I took them from the ball. They were mine, and he snatched them. And then he mated with that goddess of yours, breeding the fire into the bloodline, ensuring I would think hard before touching his land, his heirs. But all bloodlines fade, and I knew time would come when Brandon's flames would dim to a flicker, and I'd be poised to strike. Aelin sagged against the hands that held her up. But in my dark power, I saw a glimmer of the future. I saw that Mala's power would surge again, and that he would lead me to the keys. Only you, the one Brannon left clues for, the one who could find all three. And I saw who you were, what you were. I saw who you loved. I saw your mate. The sea breeze hissing through the grasses was the only sound. What a powerhouse you two would be. You and Prince Rowan, and any offspring of that union. A vicious smirk. You and Rowan could rule this continent if you wished. But your children, your children would be powerful enough to rule an empire that could sweep the world. Aelin closed her eyes. The fey males were shaking their heads slowly, not believing it. I didn't know when you would be born. But when Prince Rowan Whitethorn came into this world, when he came of age and was the strongest purebred fey male in my realm, you were still not there. And I knew what I would have to do, to leash you, to break you to my will, 
to hand over those keys without thought once you were strong and trained enough to acquire them. Aelin's shoulders shook. Tears slid out past her closed eyes. It was so easy to tug on the right psychic thread that day Rowan saw Lyria at the market, to shove him down that other path, to trick those instincts, a slight altering of fate. Oh, gods, Fenris breathed, Maeve said. So your mate was given to another, and I let him fall in love, let him get her with child, and then I broke him. No one ever asked how those enemy forces came to pass by his mountain home. Aelin's knees gave out completely. Only the invisible hands kept her upright as she wept. He took the blood out without question. And I knew that whenever you were born, whenever you'd come of age, I'd ensure that your paths crossed. And you'd take one look at each other, and I'd have you by the throat. Anything I asked for, you'd give me even the keys. For your mate, you could do no less. You almost did that day in Doranel. Slowly, Aelin slid her feet under herself again. The movement so pained that Alid cringed, but Aelin lifted her head, lip curling back from her teeth. I will kill you, Aelin snarled at the Fae Queen. That's what you said to Rowan after you met him, wasn't it? Maeve's faint smile lingered. I'd pushed and pushed your mother to bring you to me, so you could meet him, so I could have you at last when Rowan felt the bond. But she refused. And we know how well that turned out for her. And during those ten years afterward, I knew you were alive. Somewhere. And when you came to me, when you and your mate looked at each other with only hate in your eyes, I'll admit I did not anticipate it. That I had broken what Rowan Whitethorn so thoroughly that he did not recognize his own mate. And that you were so broken by your own pain, you didn't notice either. And when the signs appeared, the Karanam bond washed away any suspicion on his part that you might be his. But not you. How long has it been, Aelin, since you realized he was your mate? Aelin said nothing, her eyes churning with rage and grief and despair. A lead whispered. Leave her alone. Lorcan's grip on her tightened in warning. Maeve ignored her. Well, when did you know? At Temis's temple, Aelin admitted, glancing to Manon. The moment the arrow went through his shoulder. Months ago. And you've hidden it from him, no doubt to save him from any guilt regarding Lyria. Any sort of emotional distress. Maeve clicked her tongue. What a noble little liar you are. Aelin stared at nothing, her eyes going blank. I had planned for him to be here, Maeve said, frowning at the horizon. Since letting you two go that day in Doranel was so that you could lead me to the Keys again. I even let you think you'd gotten away with it, by freeing him. You had no idea that I unleashed you. But if he's not here... I'll have to make do. Aelin stiffened. Fenris snarled in warning. Maeve shrugged. If it's any consolation, Aelin, you would have had a thousand years with Prince Rowan. Longer. The world slowed, and Elide could hear her own blood roaring in her ears as Maeve said. My sister, Mala, my sister Mab's line ran true. The full powers, shifting abilities, and the immortality of the Fae. You're likely about five years away from settling. Aelin's face crumpled. This was not a draining of magic and physical strength, but of spirit. Perhaps we'll celebrate your settling together, Maeve mused, since I certainly have no plans to waste you on that lock, to waste the keys when they are meant to be wielded, Aelin. Maeve, please, Fenris breathed. Maeve examined her immaculate nails. What I find to be truly amusing is that it seems I didn't even need you to be Rowan's mate, or really need to break him at all. A fascinating experiment in my own powers, if anything. But since I doubt you'll still go willingly, not at least without trying to die on me first, I'll let you have a choice. Aelin seemed to be bracing herself as Maeve lifted a hand and said, 
Cairn. The males went rigid. Lorcan turned near Feral behind Elid, subtly trying to drag her back to work around the order he'd been given. A handsome brown-haired warrior walked toward them from the cluster of escorts. Handsome, if it weren't for the sadistic cruelty singing in his blue eyes. If it wasn't for the blades at his sides, the whip curled along one hip, the sneering smile. She'd seen that smile before, on Vernon's face, on so many faces at Morath. Allow me to introduce the newest member of my cadre, as you like to call them. Cairn, meet Aelin Galathinius. Cairn stepped up to his queen's side, and the look the male gave a Leeds queen made her stomach turn over. Sadist. Yes, that was the word for him, without him even saying one himself. Cairn, Maeve said, is trained in abilities that you have in common, of course. You only had a few years to learn the art of torment, but perhaps Cairn can teach you some of the, of the things he's learned in his centuries of practicing. Fenris was pale with rage. Maeve, I beg you. Darkness slammed into Fenris, shoving him to his knees, forcing his head to the dirt. That is enough, Maeve hissed. Maeve was smiling again when she turned back to Aelin. I said you have a choice, and you do. Either you come willingly with me and get acquainted with Cairn, or... Those eyes slid to Lorcan, to Aleve, and Aleve's heart stopped as Maeve said, Or I still take you, and breed Aleve Lacken with us. I'm certain she and Cairn will get along wonderfully. And that was chapter 71. <clears throat> I need a quick little stretch break. Let me just crack my back. Oh, stretch, stretch. Oh, okay. We're just going to power through this. We got four chapters left, people. Let's power through. Chapter 72. Aelin's body hurt. Everything hurt. Her blood, her breath, her bones. There was no magic left. Nothing left to save her. No, Lorcan said softly. Just turning her head sparked agony down her spine. But Aelin looked at Aleve, at Lorcan forced to hold her, his face white with pure terror as he glanced between Cairn and Maeve and Aleve. Manon was doing the same, sizing up the odds, how fast she'd have to be to clear the area. Good. Good. Manon would get Aleve out. The witch had been waiting for Aelin to make a move, not realizing that she had nothing left. There was no power left for a final strike. And that dark power was still coiled around her bones, so tightly that one move of aggression, one move and her bones would snap. Maeve said to Lorcan, No to what, Lorcan? A lead Lorcan being taken with us if Aelin decides to put up a fight? Or my generous offer to leave a lead be if her majesty comes willingly? One look at the brown-haired fey warrior, Cairn, standing at Maeve's side, and Aelin had known what he was. She'd killed enough of them over the years. She'd spent time with Rourke Farron. What he'd do to a lead. Lorcan also knew what a male like Cairn would do to a young woman. And if he was sanctioned by Maeve herself, Lorcan said, She is innocent. Take the queen and let us go. Manon even snapped at Maeve. She belongs to the Iron Teeth. If you have no quarrel with me, then you have no quarrel with her. Leave a lead Lachan out of it. Maeve ignored Manon and drawled to Lorcan. I command you to stand down. I command you to watch and do nothing. I command you to not move or speak until I say so. The order applies to you as well, Fenris. And Lorcan obeyed. So did Fenris. 
Their bodies simply stiffened, and then nothing. A lead twisted to beg Lorcan. You can stop this. You can fight it. Lorcan didn't even look at her. Aelin knew a lead would fight, would not understand that Maeve had been playing this game for centuries, and had waited until this moment, until the trap was perfect, to seize her. Aelin found Maeve smiling at her. She had played, and gambled, and lost. Maeve nodded as if to say yes. The unspoken question danced in Aelin's eyes as a lead screamed at Lorcan, at Manon, to help. But the witch knew her orders, her task. Maeve read the question in Aelin's face and said, I will bear the keys in one hand, and Aelin Firebringer in the other. She'd have to break her first. Kill her, or break... Karen grinned. The escorts were now hauling something up from the beach. From the long boat they'd rowed over from their awaiting ship. Already, the dark sails were unfurling. A lead faced Maeve, who did not deign to glance her way. Please! Please! Aelin simply nodded at the Fae Queen, her acceptance and surrender. Maeve bowed her head, triumph dancing on her red lips. Lorcan, release her. The warrior's hands slackened at his sides. And because she had won, Maeve even loosened her power's grip on Aelin's bones, allowed Aelin to turn to a lead and say, Go with Manon. She will take care of you. A lead began crying, shoving away from Lorcan. I'll go with you. I'll come with you. The girl would. The girl would face Cairn and Maeve. But Terrison would need that sort of courage. If it was to survive, if it was to heal, Terrison would need a lead Lachan. Tell the others, Aelin breathed, trying to find the right words. Tell the others that I am sorry. Tell Lysander to remember her promise and that I will never stop being grateful. Tell Adian. Tell him it is not his fault, and that, her voice cracked, I wish he'd been able to take the oath, but Terrison will look to him now, and the lines must not break. Alid nodded, tears sliding down her blood-splattered face. And tell Rowan. Aelin's soul splintered as she saw the iron box the escorts now carried between them. An ancient iron coffin, big enough for one person, crafted for her. And tell Rowan, Aelin said, fighting her own sob, that I am sorry I lied. But tell him that it was all borrowed time anyway. Even before today, I knew it was all just borrowed time. But I still wish we'd had more of it. She fought past her trembling mouth. Tell him he has to fight. He must save Terrison. And remember the vows he made to me. And tell him, tell him thank you for walking that dark path with me back to the light. They opened the lid of the box, pulling out long, heavy chains within. One of the escorts handed Maeve an ornate iron mask. She examined it in her hands. The mask, the chains, the box. They had been crafted long before now, centuries ago, forged to contain and break Mala's scion. Aelin glanced at Lorcan, whose dark eyes were fixed on her own and gratitude shown there, for sparing the young woman he'd given his heart to, whether he knew it or not. Alid begged Maeve one last time. Don't do this! Aelin knew it would do her no good, so she said to Alid, I'm glad we met. I'm proud to know you. And I think your mother would have been proud of you too, Alid. Maeve lowered the mask and drawled to Aelin. Rumor claims you will bow to no one, heir of fire, that serpentine smile. Well, now you will bow to me. She pointed to the sand. Aelin obeyed. Her knees barked as she dropped to the ground. Lower. Aelin slid her body until her brow was in the sand. She did not let herself feel it, let her soul feel it. Good. Alid was sobbing, wordlessly begging. Take off your shirt. Aelin hesitated, realizing where this was going. 
why Karen's belt carried a whip. Take off your shirt. Aelin tugged her shirt out of her pants and slung it over her head, tossing it in the sand beside her. Then she removed the flexible cloth around her breasts. Varric, Huron, two fey males came forward. Aelin didn't fight as, each, as they each gripped her by an arm and hauled her up, spread her arms wide. The sea air kissed her breasts, her navel. Ten lashes, Cairn. Let her majesty have a taste of what to expect when we reach our destination, if she does not cooperate. It would be my pleasure, lady. Aelin held Cairn's vicious gaze, willing ice into her veins as he thumbed free his whip, as he raked his eyes over her body and smiled, a canvas for him to paint with blood and pain. Maeve said, the mask dangling from her fingers. Why don't you count for us, Aelin? Aelin kept her mouth shut. Count, or we'll begin again with each stroke you miss. You decide how long this goes for. Unless you'd rather a lead Lachan receive those, these strokes. No. Never. Never anyone else but her. Never. But as Karen walked slowly, savoring each step as he let that whip drag along the ground, her body betrayed her, began shaking. She knew the pain, knew what it'd feel like, what it'd sound like. Her dreams were still full of it. No doubt why Maeve had picked a whipping, why she'd done it to Rowan and Doran now. Karen halted. She felt him studying that t the tattoo on her back, Rowan's loving words written there in the old language. Karen snorted. Then she felt him revel in how he'd destroy that tattoo. Begin, Maeve said. Karen's breath sucked in, and even bracing herself, even clamping down hard, there was nothing to prepare for the crack, the sting, the pain. She did not let herself cry out, only hissed through her teeth. A whip wielded by an overseer at Endovier was one thing. One yielded, one wielded by a full-blooded fey male. Blood slid down the back of her pants, her split skin screaming. But she knew how to pace herself. How to yield to the pain. How to take it. What number was that, Aelin? She would not. She would never count for that rutting bitch. Start over, Cairn, Maeve said. A breathy laugh. Then the crack and the pain and Aelin arched, the tendons in her neck snapping as she panted through her clenchy, te clenched teeth. The males holding her gripped her firm enough to bruise. Maeve and Cairn waited. Aelin refused to say the word, to start the count. She'd die before she did it. Oh, gods. Oh, gods. Alid sobbed. Start over, Maeve merely ordered over the girl. So Cairn did. Again. 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 They started over nine times before Aelin finally screamed, though the blow had been right atop another one, tearing skin down to the bone. Again. 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 Karen was panting. Aelin refused to speak. Start over, Maeve repeated. Majesty, murmured one of the males holding her. It might be prudent to postpone until later. <laughs> There's still plenty of skin, Karen snapped. But the male said, others are approaching, still far off. Approaching. Rowan. Aelin whimpered then. Time. She had needed time. Maeve made a small noise of distaste. distaste. We'll continue later. Get her ready. Aelin could barely lift her head as the males heaved her up. The movement sent her body roaring in such pain that darkness swarmed in. But she fought it, gritted her teeth, and silently roared back at that agony. That darkness. A few feet away, Alid slid to her knees as if she'd be beg until her body gave out. But Manon caught her. We're going now, Manon said, tugging her away, inland. No, Alid spat, thrashing. 
Lorkin's eyes widened, but with Maeve's command, he couldn't move, couldn't do anything as Manon slammed the hilt of wind cleaver into the side of a lead's head. The girl dropped like a stone. That was all Manon needed to haul her over a shoulder and say to Maeve, Good luck. Her eyes slid to Aelin's once. Only once. Then she looked away. Maeve ignored the witch as Manon prowled toward the heart of the marshes. Lorcan's body strained. Strained, like he was fighting that blood oath with everything in him. Aelin didn't care. The males half dragged her toward Maeve, toward the iron box and the chains and the iron mask. Whirls of fire, little suns and embers had been shaped into its dark surface, a mockery of the power it was to contain. The power Maeve had needed to ensure was fully drained before she locked her up. The only way she could ever lock her up. Every inch of her feet dragged through the sand was a lifetime. Every inch was a heartbeat. Blood soaked her pants. She would likely wouldn't be able to heal her wounds within all that iron. Not until Maeve decided to heal them herself. But Maeve wouldn't let her die. Not with the word keys and the balance. Not yet. Time. She was grateful Elena had given her that stolen time. Grateful she had met them all. That she had seen some small part of the world. Had heard such lovely music. Had danced and laughed and known true friendship. Grateful that she had found Rowan. She was grateful. So Aelin Galathinius dried her tears. And did not fight when Maeve strapped that beautiful iron mask over her face. And that was chapter 72. I think we're just going to power through it and uh, finish up this book because we don't have that long. We have only about 20 pages. I mean, I don't know how much longer it takes. I might have to like finish listening from home. Okay. We'll see. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. And we shall power through. On to chapter 73. Manon kept walking. She didn't dare look back. Didn't dare give that ancient, cold-eyed queen one hint that Aelin did not possess the word keys. That Aelin had slipped them both into Manon's pocket when she nudged her. Elid would hate her for it. Already did hate her for it. Let that be the cost. One look from Aelin and she'd known what she had to do. Get the keys away from Maeve. Get a lead away. They had forged an iron box to contain the Queen of Terrasen. A lead stirred, at last coming to, just as they were nearly out of hearing range. She began thrashing, and Manon dumped her behind a dune, gripping the back of her neck so tightly a lead stilled at the iron nails piercing her skin. Silence, Manon hissed, and a lead obeyed. Keeping low, they peered through the grasses. Only a moment. She could only spare. O she could spare only a moment to watch, to glean where Maeve was taking the Queen of Terrasen. Lorcan remained frozen as Maeve had commanded. Gavriel was barely conscious, panting in the grass, as if ripping that blood oath from him had been a grave, as grave as any physical wound. Fenris. Fenris's eyes were alive with hatred as he watched Maeve and Cairn. Blood coated Cairn's whip, still dangling at his side, as Maeve's soldiers finished strapping that mask over Aelin's face. Then they clamped irons around her wrists, ankles, neck. No one healed her ravaged back, barely more than a bloody slab of meat as they guided her into the iron box, made her lie upon her wounds, and then slid the lid into place, locked it. A lead vomited in the grass. Manon put a hand on the girl's back as the males began carrying the box down the dunes, to the boat and the ship beyond. Fenris, go, Maeve ordered, pointing to the ship. Breathing raggedly, but unable to refuse the order, Fenris followed. He glanced once at the white shirt discarded in the sand. It was splattered with blood, spray from the whipping. Then he was gone, stepping through the air and wind and into nothing. Alone with Lorcan, Maeve said to the warrior, You have done all this for me? He did not move, Maeve said. Speak. Lorcan loosed a shuddering breath and said, Yes, 
Yes, it was all for you. All of it. Alid gripped the seagrass in fistfuls. And Manon half wondered if she'd grow iron nails and shred it apart with the fury in her face. The hate. Maeve stepped over Aelin's blood-splattered shirt and brushed her hand over Lorcan's cheek. I have no use, she crooned, for self-righteous males who think they know best. He stiffened. Majesty, I strip you of the blood oath. I strip you of your assets and your titles and your properties. You, like Gavriel, are released with dishonor and shame. You are exiled from Doranel for your disobedience, your treachery. Should you step foot inside my borders, you will die. Majesty, I beg you. Go beg someone else. I have no use for a warrior I cannot trust. I rescind my kill order. Letting you live with the shame will be far worse for you, I think. Blood welled at his wrist, then hers, spilling on the ground. Lorcan fell to his knees. I do not suffer fools gladly, Maeve said, leaving him in the sand and walked away. As if she dealt him a blow, the twin to Gavriel's, Lorcan couldn't seem to move, to think or breathe. He tried crawling, though, toward Maeve. The bastard tried crawling. We need to go, Manon murmured. The moment Maeve checked to see where those keys were, they had to go. A roar grumbled on the horizon. Abraxos. Her heart thundered in her chest, joy sparking, but... A lead remained in the grass, watching Lorcan crawl toward the queen now striding across the breach, the beach, black gown flowing behind her, watching the boat row to the awaiting ship, that iron coffin in its center, Maeve sitting beside it, one hand on the lid. For her sanity, Manon prayed that Aelin wouldn't be awake the entire time she was inside. And for the sake of their world, Manon prayed the Queen of Terrison could survive it. If only so Aelin could then die for them all. And that was chapter 73. Hey, see, me too. You have a lot to catch up on later on YouTube. A lot has happened and we are about to finish the book. Two more chapters. On to chapter 74. There was so much blood. It had spread to where Lorcan was kneeling, gleaming bright as it soaked into the sand. It covered her shirt, discarded and forgotten beside him. It even speckled the scabbards of her swords and knives, littered around him like bones. What Maeve had done. What Aelin had done. There was a hole in his chest. And there was so much blood. Wings and roaring, and he still couldn't look up, couldn't bring himself to care. A lead's voice cut across the world, saying to someone, The ship! The ship just vanished! She left without realizing we have the... Whoops of joy, female cries of happiness, thunderous swift steps. Then a hand gripping his hair, yanking back his head as a dagger settled along his throat. As Rowan's face, calm with lethal wrath, appeared in his vision. Where is Aelin? There was pure panic, too. Pure panic as Whitethorn saw the blood, the scattered blades, and the shirt. Where is Aelin? What had he done? What had he done? Pain sliced Lorcan's neck. Warm blood dribbled down his throat, his chest. Rowan hissed, Where is my wife? Lorcan swayed where he knelt. Wife. Wife. Oh, God. Alid sobbed as she overheard the words, carrying the sound of Lorcan's own fractured heart. Oh, God. And for the first time in centuries, Lorcan wept. Rowan dug the dagger deeper into Lorcan's neck, even as tears slid down Lorcan's face. What that woman had done. Aelin had known that Lorcan had betrayed her and summoned Maeve here that she had been living on borrowed time and she had married whitethorn so terrison could have a king perhaps had been spurred into action because she knew lorcan had already betrayed her that Maeve was coming and lorcan had not helped her whitethorn's wife 
his mate. Aelin had let them whip and chain her, had gone willingly with Maeve, so a lead didn't enter Cairn's clutches, and it had been just as much a sacrifice for a lead as it had been a gift to him. She had bowed to Maeve for a lead. Please, Rowan begged, his voice breaking as that calm fury fractured. Maeve took her, Manon said, approaching. Gavriel rasped from where he knelt nearby, reeling from the severing of his blood oath. She used the oath to keep us down, to keep us from helping, even Lorcan. Rowan still didn't remove the knife from Lorcan's throat. Lorcan had been wrong. He had been so wrong. And he could not entirely regret it. Not if Elide was safe, but... Aelin had refused to count. Karen had unleashed his full strength on her with that whip, and she had refused to give them the satisfaction of counting. Where is the ship? Adian demanded, then swore at the bloody shirt nearby. He grabbed Goldrin, frantically wiping the blood specks off the scabbard with his jacket. It vanished, Alid said again. It just vanished. Whitethorn stared down at him, agony and despair in those eyes, and Lorcan whispered, I'm sorry. Rowan dropped the knife, released the fist grabbing Lorcan's hair, staggered back a step. In the grass nearby, Dorian knelt beside Gavriel, a faint light glowing around them, healing the wounds in his arms. There was nothing to be done for the soul wound Maeve had dealt him, dealt Lorcan as well, in severing that oath with such dishonor. Manon came closer, her witches now flanking her. They all sniffed at the blood. A golden-haired one swore, swore softly. Manon told them about the lock, about Elena, about the cost the gods demanded of her, demanded of Aelin. But it was a lead who then took up the thread, leaning against Lysandra, who was staring at that blood and that shirt as if it were a corpse, telling them what had happened on these dunes, what Aelin had sacrificed. She told Rowan that he was Aelin's mate, told him about Lyria, she told them about the whipping and the mask and the box. When Elid finished, they were silent, and Lorcan only watched as Adian turned to Lysandra and snarled, You knew? Lysandra did not flinch. She asked me, that day on the boat, to help her. She told me the suspected price to banish Erewhon and restore the keys, what I needed to do. Adian snarled, What could you possibly... Lysandra lifted her chin. Rowan breathed. Aelin would die to forge the new lock to seal the keys into the gate, to banish Erewhon. But no one would know. No one but us. Not while you wore her skin for the rest of your life. Adian dragged a hand through his blood-caked hair. But any offspring with Rowan wouldn't look anything like... Lysandra's face was pleading. You would fix that, Adian with me. With the golden hair, the Ash River eyes. If that line bred true, the shifter's offspring could pass as royal. Aelin wanted Rowan on the throne, but it would be Adian secretly siring the heirs. Adian flinched as if he'd been struck. And when were you going to reveal this? Before or after I thought I was taking my god's damned cousin to bed for whatever reason you concocted. Lysandra said softly, I will not apologize to you. I serve her, and I am willing to spend the rest of my life pretending to be her so that her sacrifice isn't in vain. You can go to hell, Adian snapped. You can go to hell, you lying bitch. Lysandra's answering snarl wasn't human. Rowan just took Goldrin from the general and walked toward the sea, the wind tossing his silver hair. Lorcan rose to his feet, swaying again. But Elid was there, and there was nothing of the young woman he'd come to know in her pace, in her pale, taut face. Nothing of her in the raw voice as Elid said to Lorcan, I hope you spend the rest of your miserable, immortal life suffering. I hope you spend it alone. I hope you live with regret and guilt in your heart and never find a way to endure it. Then she was heading for the thirteen. The golden-haired one held up an arm, and Elid stepped, slipped beneath it and entering a sanctuary of wings and claws and teeth. Lysandra stormed to tend to Gavriel, 
who had the good sense not to flinch at her still snarling face. And Lorcan looked to Adian to find the young general already watching him. Hatred shone in Adian's eyes, pure hatred. Even before you got the, ant the order to stand down, you did nothing to help her. You summoned Maeve here. I will never forget that. Then he was striding for the beach to where Rowan knelt in the sand. Asterin was alive. The thirteen were alive, and it was joy in Manon's heart. Joy, she realized, as she beheld those smiling faces and smiled back. She said to Asterin, all of them standing among their wyverns on a dune overlooking the sea, How? Asterin brushed a hand over Alid's hair as the girl wept into her shoulder. Your grandmother's bitches gave us one hell of a chase, but we managed to gut them. We've spent the past month looking for you, but Abraxos found us and seemed to know where you were, so we followed him. She scratched at some dried blood on her cheek, and saved your ass, apparently. Not soon enough, Manon thought, seeing Alid's silent tears, the way the humans and Fay were either standing or arguing or just doing nothing. Not soon enough to stop this, to save Aelin Galathinius. What do we do now? Sorrel asked, from where she leaned against her bull's flank, wrapping up a slice in her forearm. The thirteen all looked to Manon, all waited. She dared to ask. Did you hear what my grandmother said before? Everything. The shadows told us, Asterin said, eyes dancing. And? And what? Sorrel grunted. So you're half Kraken. Kraken queen and heir to Rhiannon Kraken's likeness. Had the ancients noted it? Asterin shrugged. Five centuries of pure-blooded iron teeth couldn't bring us home. Maybe you can. A child not of war, but of peace. And will you follow me? Manon asked them quietly. To do what needs to be done before we can return to the wastes. Aelin Galathinius had not beseeched Elena for another fate. She had only asked for one thing. One request of the ancient queen. Will you come with me? For the same reason Manon had now asked them. As one, the thirteen lifted their fingers to their brows. As one, they lowered them. Manon looked toward the sea, her throat tight. Aelin Galathinius willingly handed her over her freedom so an iron teeth witch could walk free, Manon said. Elide straightened, pulling from Asterin's arms. But Manon continued, we owe her a life debt, and more than that, it is time we became better than our foremothers. We are all children of this land. What are you going to do? Asterin breathed, her eyes so bright. Manon looked behind them, to the north. I am going to find the Krakens, and I am going to raise an army with them, for Aelin Galathinius, and her people, and for ours. They'll never trust us, Sorrel said. Asterin drawled. Then we'll just have to be our charming selves. Some of them smirked. Some of them shifted on their feet. Manon said again to her thirteen. Will you follow me? And when they all touched their fingers to their brows again, Manon returned the gesture. Rowan and Adian were sitting silently on the beach. Gavriel had recovered enough from the shock of the oath's severing that he and Lorcan were now standing atop the bluff, talking quietly. Lysandra was sitting alone, in ghost leopard form, amongst the waving sea grasses, and Dorian was just watching them from the apex of a dune. What Aelin had done, what she lied about. Some of the blood on the ground had dried. If Aelin was gone, if her life would indeed be the cost if she ever got free. Maeve doesn't have the two keys, Manon said from Dorian's side, having crept up silently. Her coven lingered behind her, a lead ensconced within their ranks, in case you were concerned. Lorcan and Gavriel turned toward them, then Lysandra. Dorian dared to ask, Then where are they? I have them, Manon said simply. Aelin slid them into my pocket. Oh, Aelin. Aelin. She'd worked Maeve into such a frenzy, made the queen so focused on capturing her that she hadn't thought to confirm if Aelin held the keys before she vanished. 
She'd been dealt such a wicked, impossible hand, and yet, Aelin had made it count. One last time, she'd made it count. It's why I couldn't do anything about it, Manan said. To help her, I had to look uninvolved, neutral, from where he sat on the beach below. Adian had twisted toward them, his keen fey hearing feeding them every word. Manan said to all of them, I am sorry. I am sorry I couldn't help. She reached into the pocket of her riding leathers and extended the amulet of Orinth and a sliver of black stone to Dorian. He balked. Elena said Mala's bloodline can stop this. It runs in both your houses. The golden eyes were wary, heavy. He realized what Manon was asking. Aelin had never planned to see Terrison again. She had married Rowan knowing she would have months at best, days at worst with him. But she would give Terrison a legal king to hold her territory together. She had made plans for all of them, and none for herself. The quest does not end here, Dorian said softly. Manon shook her head, and he knew she meant more than the keys, than the war, as she said. No, it does not. She took the, he took the keys from her. They throbbed and flickered, warming his palm. A foreign, horrible presence, and yet, all that stood between them and destruction. No, the quest did not end here, not even close. Dorian slid the keys into his pocket, and the road that now sprawled away before him, curving into unknown, awaiting shadow. It did not frighten him. And that was chapter 74. We have one chapter left, guys. We are just going to power through it. I think it can't get more intense. It does. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Rowan had married Aelin before dawn barely two days ago. Aidan and Lysandra had been the only witnesses as they'd awoken the bleary-eyed captain who married them quickly and quietly and signed a vow of secrecy. They'd had 15 minutes in their cabin to consummate that marriage. Aidan still carried the formal documents, the captain bearing the duplicates. Rowan had been kneeling on that spit of beach for half an hour now, silent, wandering the paths of his churning thoughts. Aidan had kept him company, staring blankly at the sea. Rowan had known. Part of him had known that Aelin was his mate, and had turned away from that knowledge, again and again, out of respect for Lyria, out of terror for what it'd mean. He'd leapt in front of her at Skull's Bay, knowing it, deep down, knowing mates, aware of the bond, could not bear to harm each other, and that it might be the only force to compel her to regain control from Deanna. And even when she had proved him right, he had turned that from that proof, still unready, pushing it from his mind even as he claimed her in every other way. Aelin had known, though, that he was her mate, and she had not crushed it or demanded he face it, because she loved him, and he knew she'd rather carve out her own heart than cause him pain or distress. His fire heart, his equal, his friend, his lover, his wife, his mate. That God's damned bitch had put her in an iron box. She'd whipped his mate so brutally that he'd rarely seen such blood spilled as a result. Then chained her. Then put Aelin in a veritable, veritable iron coffin, still bleeding, still hurting. To contain her. To break her. To torture her. His fire heart locked in the dark. She'd tried to tell him, right before the Ilkin converged. Tried to tell him she'd vomited her guts up on the ship that day, not because she was pregnant, but because she'd realized she was going to die. That the cost of sealing the gate, forging a new lock to do so, was her life. Her immortal life. Goldrin lying beside him, its ruby dull in the bright sun. Rowan gathered up two fistfuls of sand and let the grain slide out, let the wind carry them toward the sea. It was all borrowed time anyway. Aelin did not expect them to come for her. She who had come for them, who had found them all. She had arranged for everything to fall into place when she yielded her life. 
when she gave up a thousand years to save them. And Rowan knew she believed they'd make the right choice, the wise choice, and remain here. Lead their armies to victory, the armies she'd secured for them, guessing that she wouldn't be there to see it through. She did not think she'd ever see him again. He did not accept that. He would not accept that. And he would not accept that he had found her, and she had found him, and they had survived such sorrow and pain and despair together, only to be cleaved apart. He would not accept the fate that had been dealt to her, would not accept that her life was the asking price for saving this world, her life, or Dorian's. He would not accept it for one heartbeat. Footsteps thudded on the sand, and he scented Lorcan before he bothered to look. For half a breath, he debated killing the male where he stood. Rowan knew that today, today he'd win. Something had fractured in Lorcan, and if Rowan attacked now, the other male would die. Lorcan might not even put up much of a fight. Lorcan's granite-hewn face was hard, but his eyes? That was agony in them, and regret. The others flowed down the dunes, the witch's coven remaining behind, and Adian rose to his feet. They all stared at Rowan as he remained kneeling. The sea rolled away, undulating under the clearing blue sky. He speared that bond into the world, casting it as wide as a net, flinging it out with his magic, his soul, his cracked heart, searching for her. Fight it, he willed her, sending the words down the bond, the mating bond, which perhaps had settled into place that first moment they'd become Karanam, hidden beneath flame and ice and hope for a better future. Fight her! I am coming for you. Even if it takes me a thousand years, I will find you. I will find you. I will find you. Only salt and wind and water answered him. Rowan rose to his feet and slowly turned to face them. But their attention snagged on the ships now sailing out of the west from the battle site. His cousin's ships, with what remained of the fleet Ansel of Briarcliff had won for them, and Rolf's three ships. But it was not those boats that made him pause. It was the one that rounded the eastern tip of the land. A long boat. It swept closer on a phantom wind, too fast to be natural. Rowan braced himself. The boat's shape didn't belong to any of the fleets assembled. But its style nagged at his memory. From their own fleet, Ansel of Briarcliff and Enda were soaring over the waves in a long boat, aiming for this beach. But Rowan and the others watched in silence as the foreign boat crested through the surf and slid onto the sand. Watch the olive-skinned sailors haul it up the beach. A broad-shouldered young man nimbly leaped out, his slightly curling dark hair tossed in the sea breeze. He did not emit a whiff of fear as he stalked for them, didn't even go for the comforting touch of the fine sword at his side. Where is Aelin Galathinius? The stranger asked a bit breathlessly as he scanned them. And his accent. Who are you? Rowan ground out. But the young man was now close enough that Rowan could see the color of his eyes. Turquoise with a core of gold. Adian breathed as if in a trance. Galen. Galen Ash River, crown prince of Wendelin. The young man's eyes widened as he took in the warrior prince. Adian he said hoarsely, something like awe and grief in his face. But he blinked it away, self-assured and steady, and again asked, Where is she? None of them answered. Adian demanded, What are you doing here? Galen's dark brows flicked toward each other. I thought she would have informed you. Informed of us of what? Rowan said too quietly. Galen reached into the pocket of his worn blue tunic, pulling out a crinkled letter that looked like it had been re read a hundred times. He silently handed it to Rowan. Her scent still clung to it as he unfolded the paper, Adian reading over his shoulder. Aelin's letter to the Prince of Gwendolyn had been short, brutal. The large letters were sprawled across the page as if her temper had gotten the better of her. Terrison remembers Evelyn Ash River. Do you... I fought at Missward for your people. Return the gods' damned favor. And then coordinates for this spot. It only went to me, Galen said softly. 
not to my father, only to me. To the armada that Galen controlled as a blockade runner against Adderlin. Rowan, Lysandra murmured in warning. He followed her stare. Not to where Ansel and Enda now arrived at the edge of their group, giving the thirteen a wide berth as they lifted their brows at Galen, but to the small company of white-clad people that appeared on the cresting dunes behind them, splattered in mud and looking like they had trekked across the marshes themselves. And Rowan knew. He knew who they were before they even reached the beach. Ansel of Briarcliff had gone pale at the sight of their layered, flowing clothes. And as the tall male in the center peeled his hood off his hood to reveal a brown-skinned, green-eyed face still handsome with youth, the queen of the waste whispered, Ilias. Ilias, son of the mute master of the silent assassins, gaped at Ansel, his back stiffening. But Rowan stepped toward the man, drawing his attention. Ilias's eyes narrowed in assessment, and he like Galen, scanned them all, searching for a golden-haired woman who was not there. His eyes returned to Rowan as if he'd marked him as the axis of this group. In a voice hoarse from disuse, Ilias asked, We have come to fulfill our life debt to Selena Sardathian, to Aelin Galathinius. Where is she? You are the Sezi Sukast, Dorian said, shaking his head. The silent assassins of the Red Desert. Ilias nodded, and glanced at Ansel, who still seemed near vomiting, before saying to Rowan, It seems my friend has called in many debts in addition to ours. As if the words themselves were a signal, more white-clad figures filled the dunes behind them. Dozens. Hundreds. Rowan wondered if every single assassin from that desert keep had come to honor their debt to the young woman, a lethal lesion in themselves. And Galen. Rowan turned to the crown prince of Wendelin. How many? he asked. How many did you bring? Galen only smiled a bit and pointed to the eastern horizon, where white sails now broke over its rim. Ship after ship after ship, each bearing the cobalt flag of Wendelin. Tell Aelin Galathinius that Wendelin has never forgotten Evelyn Ashriver, Galen said to him, to Adian. Or Terrison. Adian fell to his knees in the sand as Wendelin's armada spread before them. I promise you that no matter how far I go, no matter the cost, when you call for my aid, I will come, Aelin had told him she'd sworn to Darrow. I'm going to call in old debts and promises, to raise an army of assassins and thieves and exiles and commoners. And she had. She had meant and accomplished every word of it. Rowan counted the ships that slid over the horizon, counted the ships in their own armada, added Rolfs and the Mycenaeans he was rallying in the north. Holy gods, Dorian breathed, as Wendelin's armada kept spreading wider and wider. Tears slid down Adian's face as he silently, slopped, silently sobbed. Where are our allies, Aelin? Where are our armies? She had taken the criticism, taken it, because he knew she hadn't wanted to disappoint them if she failed. Rowan put a hand on Adian's shoulder. All of it for Terrison. She had said that day she'd revealed she'd schemed her way into getting Arobin's fortune. And Rowan knew that every step she had taken, every plan and calculation, every secret and desperate gamble. For Terrison. For them. For a better world. Aelin Galathinius had raised an army not just to challenge Morath, but to rattle the stars. She'd known that she would not get to lead it, but she would still hold true to her promise to Darrow. I promise you on my blood, on my family's name, that I will not turn my back on Terrison as you have turned your back on me. And the last piece of it. If Kaol Westfall and Nesrin Felik could rally forces from the southern continent, Adian at last looked up at him, eyes wide as he came to the same realization. A chance. His wife, his mate, had bought them a fool's shot at this war. And she did not believe that they would come for her. Galen? 
Rowan went still as death as at the voice that floated over the dunes, at the golden-haired woman who wore the skin of his beloved. Adian shot to his feet, about to snarl, when Rowan gripped his arm. When Lysandra, as Aelin, as she had promised, swept for them, grinning wide. That smile. It punched a hole through his heart. Lysandra had taught herself Aelin's smile, that bit of wickedness and delight, honed with that razor edge of cruelty. Lysandra's acting, honed in the same hellhole Aelin had learned hers, was flawless as she spoke to Galen. As she spoke to Ilias, embracing him like a long-lost friend and a relieved ally. Adian was trembling beside him, but the world could not know. Their allies, their enemies, could not know that the immortal fire of Mala had been stolen. Leashed. Galen said to the one whom he believed to be his cousin, Where now? Lysandra looked to him, then to Adian, not a sign of regret or guilt or doubt on her face. We go north, to Terrison. Rowan's stomach turned leaden, but Lysandra caught his eye and said steadily and casually, Prince, I need you to retrieve something for me before you join us in the north. Find her, find her, find her, the shifter seemed to beg. Rowan nodded, at a loss for words. Lysandra took his hand, squeezed it once in thanks, a polite public farewell between a queen and her consort, and stepped away. Come, Lysandra said to Galen and Ilias, motioning them toward where white-faced Ansel and frowning, frowning Enda waited. We have matters to discuss before we head out. Then their little company was alone once more. Adian's hands clenched and unclenched at his sides as he gazed after the shapeshifter wearing Aelin's skin, leading their allies down the beach to give them privacy. An army to take on Morath, to give them a fighting chance. Sand whispered behind him as Lorcan stepped up to his side. I will go with you. I will help you get her back. Gavriel rasped. We'll find her. Adian at last looked away from Lysandra at that, but he said nothing to his father, had said nothing to him at all since they'd landed on that beach. Alid took a limping step closer, her voice as raw as Gavriel's. Together. We'll go together. Lorcan gave the Lady of Paranth an assessing look that she made a point to ignore. His eyes flickered as he said to Rowan, Fenris is with her. He'll know we're coming for her. Try to leave tracks if you can. And Ma if Maeve didn't have him on lockdown. But Fenris had battled the Blood Oath every day since we swearing it. And if he was all that now stood between Cairn and Aelin, Rowan didn't let himself think about Cairn about what Maeve had already done, had him do, or would do to her before the end. No, Fenris would fight it, and Aelin would fight it. Aelin would never stop fighting. Rowan faced Adian, and the warrior prince again peeled his attention away from Lysandra long enough to meet his eyes. Adian understood the look, and put a hand on the sword of Orin's hilt. I'll go north, with her to oversee the armies and make sure it's all in place. Rowan clasped Adian's forearm. The lines have to hold. Buy us whatever time you can, brother. Adian gripped his forearm in return, eyes burning bright. Rowan knew how much it killed him, but if the world believed Aelin was returning north, then one of her generals had to be at her side to lead her armies. And since Adian commanded the loyalty of the Bane, bring her back, prince. Adian said, voice, crank, voice cracking. Bring her home. Rowan held his brother's stare and nodded. We will see you again, all of you. He did not waste words persuading the warrior prince to forgive the shifter. He wasn't entirely sure what to even make of Aelin and Lysandra's plan, what his role would have been in it. Dorian stepped forward, but glanced to Manon who was staring toward the sea as if she could see where Maeve had spirited away her ship, using that cloaking power she'd wielded to hide Fenris and Gavriel in Skull's Bay, hide her armada from the eyes of Eelway. The witches fly north, Dorian said, and I will go with them, to see if I can do what needs to be done. Stay with us, 
Rowan offered. We'll find a way to deal with the keys and the lock and the gods. All of it. Dorian shook his head. If you go after Maeve, the keys should be kept far away. If I can help by doing this, by finding the third, I will serve you better that way. You'll likely die, Avian cut in sharply. We go north to bloodshed and killing fields. You head into dangers far worse than that. Morath will be waiting. Rowan cut him a glare, but his brother was beyond caring. No, Aideen was riding a vicious, vulnerable edge right now, and it wouldn't take much for that edge to turn lethal. Especially when Dorian had played his part in separating Aelin from their group. Dorian again looked to Manon, who now smiled faintly at him. It was a smile that softened her face, made it come alive. He won't die if I can help it, the witch said, then surveyed them all. We journeyed to find the Krakens, to rally what forces they might have. A witch army to counter the Iron Teeth legions. Hope, precious, fragile hope, stirred Rowan's blood. Manon merely jerked her chin in farewell and prowled up the, bru the bluff to her coven. So Rowan nodded to Dorian, but the man bowed his head, not the gesture of a friend to a friend, but of one king to another. Consort he wanted to say. He was just her consort. Even if she'd married him so he could have the legal right to save Terrison and rebuild it. To command the armies she'd given everything to gather for them. When we are done, I will join you in Terrison, Adian, the King of Adderlin promised. So that when you get back, Rowan, when both of you get back, there will be something left to fight for. Adian seemed to consider, to weigh the man's words and expression. And then the general prince stepped forward and embraced the king. It was quick and hard, and Dorian flinched, but that edge in Adian's grief-dull eyes had been eased a bit. Silently, Adian glanced at Damaris, sheathed at Dorian's side. The blade of Adderlin's first and greatest king. Adian seemed to weigh its presence, who bore it. At last, the general prince nodded, more to himself than anyone. But Dorian still bowed his head in thanks. When Adian had stalked toward the longboats, deliberately stepping around Lysandra Aelin, when she tried to speak to him, Rowan said to the king, You trust the witches? Anon. They're leaving two wyverns to guard your ship to the edge of the continent. From there, they'll join us again, and you'll set off wherever... wherever you need to go. Maeve could have taken her anywhere, vanished that ship halfway across the world. Rowan said to Dorian, Thank you. Don't thank me, a half smile. Thank Manon. If they all lived through this, if he got Aelin back, he would. He embraced Dorian, wished the king well, and watched the man climb up the sandbank to the white-haired witch who waited for him. Lysandra was already giving orders to Galen and Ilias regarding transporting the two hundred silent assassins onto Wendelin's ships, Adian monitoring with crossed arms. Ansel was deep in conversation with Endymion, who didn't seem to quite know what to do with the red-haired queen with a wolf smile. Ansel, however, seemed already inclined to raise hell and have a damn good time doing it. Rowan wished he had more than a moment to spare to thank them both, to thank Enda and each of his one of his cousins. All was set. All was ready for that desperate push north, as Aelin had planned. There would be no rest, no waiting. They did not have the time to spare. The wyverns stirred, flapping their wings. Dorian climbed into the saddle behind Manon and wrapped his arms around her waist. The witch said something that made him smile. Truly smile. Dorian lifted his hand in farewell, wincing as a Braxo soared into the skies. Ten other wyverns took to the air behind them. The grinning, golden-haired witch, Astern, and a slender, black-haired, green-eyed one named Briar waited atop their mounts for Gavriel, Lorcan, and Alid to carry them to the ship that would take them hunting across the sea. Lorcan made to step toward Alid as she approached Asterin's wyvern, but she ignored him, didn't even look at the male, as she took Asterin's hand and was hauled up into the saddle. And though Lorcan hit it well, Rowan caught the glimmer of devastation on those centuries-hardened features. Gavriel's barked curse as he gripped the golden-haired witch's waist was the only sound of his unease as they flapped into the sky. Only when they were all airborne did Rowan slowly walk up the sandy hill, tying Goldrin's ancient scabbard to his knife belt as he went. Her blood-splattered shirt was still lying there, 
just to the side of the pool of her blood soaking the sand. He had no doubt Cairn had purposefully left it. Rowan bent, picking up the shirt, running his thumbs over the soft fabric. The coven faded into the horizon. His companions reached their ship, and the others were readying to move the army his mate had summoned for them, pushing the longboats into the surf. Rowan brought the shirt to his face and breathed in her scent. Felt something stir in him. Felt the, blonde, the bond flicker. He let the shirt drop, let the wind carry it far out to sea, far away from this blood-drenched place that reeked of pain. I will find you. Rowan shifted and soared high on a fast, wicked wind of his own making, the glimmering sea sprawling to his right, the marshes a green and gray tangle to his left. Chaining the wind to him, swiftly catching up with his companions now flying down the coast, he committed her scent to memory, committed that flicker in the bond to memory. That flicker he could have sworn he felt an answer, like the fluttering heart of an ember. Unleashing a cry that set the world trembling, Prince Rowan Wrightthorn Galathinius, consort to the Queen of Terrison, began the hunt to find his wife. And that is the end of the book. Yeah. Thank you so much, everybody, for hanging out with me tonight and listening to that. As always, here is the tandem read guide for your perusal. We just finished up Empire of Storms, so next time we will be reading Tower of Dawn. I don't know if we will get to finish it all in one go, as that is quite a bit to read. Um, but we will be reading it until it is over. Thank you all so much for hanging out with me tonight. I don't think I'm going to raid anybody just because I'm very tired and my throat hurts. Um, but I hope you all have a very, very good night. Make sure to take care of yourselves. Eat lots of food. Drink lots of water. Get lots of rest. And I will see you all next time. Bye!